Oh, time to um, present our speaker for today. I am so excited to, to listen to what Dr. Timothy has to say. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and give a brief intro on his achievements. Dr. Timothy Olaolu Adebole has a Bachelor of Medicine and has a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery from Lagos State. He is also a Doctor of Psychology from Manchester, a fellow at the West African College of Physicians with a certificate of completion of specialist training and an authority of Medical Royal Colleges, GMC, and GMC specialist registration in the UK in general adult psychiatry. He's an experienced mental health service administrator and astute clinician with an extensive practice in Nigeria and the United Kingdom. He has special interest in stress management and community care and rehabilitation. He's the former provost and medical director, Neuropsychiatric Hospital, Aro, Abiokuta, Nigerian's uh, mo foremost mental health care training and research institute. Next um, slide, please. He's a skillful multidisciplinary collaborator and a transformational leader with high commitment to professionalism, integrity, continued professional development and quality improvement in mental health service delivery. Currently, he is the project director, Hope Resource Abiokuta, a resident support facility for individuals recovering from severe mental disorder. He is the founder chair, Hope Restoration and Health Initiative, a registered nonprofit and mental health advocacy, community care and rehabilitation center. Drum roll, please, for Dr. Timothy. We are so grateful that you're able to do this for us and we're so excited to hear you share your wealth of knowledge on this topic. Over to you, Dr. Timothy. Welcome to the call. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone again. Uh, we'll be, as been announced, we'll be talking about dealing with stress and burnout as uh, healthcare providers. And uh, to begin with, I want to uh, say this. Uh, working in the healthcare space uh, often puts caregivers under a lot of strain. And uh, consider even the goal of this project, reducing indirect causes of maternal morbidity and maternity, that's a, a huge one. I mean, uh, but along the line, the emotional toll of caregiving is quite enormous, but it goes uh, unrecognized or under-recognized because health workers and well-being is often taken for granted. We are supposed to be you know, client focused, you know, that sort of you know, attitude. But we remember each time we take the plane, the airplane, we are told, that in case of an emergency, which nobody prays for, uh, we should put on our own mask before trying to help others, even our children. Uh, so should that not also be uh, the case for caregivers? Uh, we believe that the well-being of the healthcare provider is critical to quality service delivery. And I believe that's why uh, the MDOC is uh, putting on this uh, program. So next slide. Why do we talk about stress? Uh, we do know there is a well-known scientific you know, information about relationship between stress and uh, disturbance of function. And uh, it goes either way and it becomes a cycle. Whenever there's a disturbance of function in other psychological level, social level, or even physiological level, uh, you know, it triggers you know, what you can refer to as stress reaction. We're still going to understand what stress is actually. And then once, once there's also stress, this feedbacks again into further disturbance of uh, functioning and it goes on in the cycle. And if you don't interrupt that cycle, then it leads into disorders, disabilities and uh, death. Although we say, God forbid, but it happens. We hear somebody suddenly drop dead and that's it. Something has been going on which has not been interrupted. So let's go to the next slide. So that's why we're doing talking about stress. What is stress? Yes, uh, to go straight to the point, stress is the disturbance of steady state. 
as health workers, we are aware of what we call homeostasis. Uh, that's the steady state of an organism, of, of an individual. And when there is a disturbance of this steady state, uh, as a result of perceived imbalance between demands and capabilities, stress results. So stress is simply the disturbance of steady state. When the organism perceives an imbalance between the demands placed upon it and the capability and the, or the resources available. This passive imbalance leads to a subjective experience of distress. And it is as its behavioral changes and bodily responses, which goes with it. And by the way, stress, we look at it in three models, with three models. Stress is stimulus, is stress a perception, is stress a response. Both are correct. Yes, we may say, oh, the environment is stressful. My work is stressful, you know. That's just looking at it as a stimulus. Because what you see as stressful, the other person is seeing it as uh, an opportunity. Oh, there's no fuel in the town and all that. And somebody says, wow, opportunity for business. Let's go into black market business. So that's it. And then, so the perception is very important about whatever stimulus come across us. How we interpret it will determine how we respond to it. The response is basically physiological. It's not really our making. We are wired to respond that way, either to fight or to escape, you know, and that's one of the innate mechanism of the body to, you know, escape, you know, adversities. And this capacity to cope with stress is one of the yardstick to measure mental health, you know. So when we look at somebody's capacity to cope with stress, we do know we can assess his mental health from that. So what's the relationship between work and stress? Yes, uh, work we see as a psychic uh, energy channeled into survival means. That's work, otherwise uh, other things like if you, if you channel your energy into leisure, that's, that's play. But when you channel it into survival means that becomes work. So job stress is simply the harmful physical and emotional responses that occur when the requirements of the job does not match the individual uh, skills or resources, or does not meet the need of the worker. So, and it's been found that job satisfaction is actually a predictor of uh, you know, the, the, the time people, at the, the age at which people might die, even more predictive than measures as, you know, obvious as smoking habits, economic position and uh, security. This was a study done much you know, long ago. So we do know that job satisfaction is very important. And uh, in 20, 2004, uh, the ILO, International Labor Organization dropped a, a bombshell. They say work is deadlier than war. That is looking over the space of time, how many people die out of warfare and looking at how many people die out of you know, consequences of job stress. It was found that people that die out of consequences of you know, dissatisfied job or work stress is much higher you know, in statistics. And that's just to tell us how important is what we're talking about, the relationship between work and stress. So what's the extent of this problem? It is uh, believed uh, that at least 30% of the work workforce uh, is believed to be experiencing health damaging stress at work. Uh, mind you, we spend how many hours at work? The minimum we should really spend is eight hours. And then the maximum, depending on the overtime and the nature of your job, and all that could be much more. And the other time we spend with other people, at home, at play, everything is not up to the eight hours. The remaining time we sleep, you know. So uh, among health workers, you know, a survey I did back at 2000, mid 2000 and 2013, uh, over 70% or close to 70%, you know, uh, really acknowledge, you know, the presence of job stress. Uh, and then among the executives, we had a series of work among them, which was published. Uh, you know, executives, we're talking about top managers, directors from various organizations in the country who participated in the, in, uh, in the workshop and the study. 
they, I mean, similar high percentage actually also reported, you know, the experience of moderate, you know, mild, you know, very and extreme, you know, level of stress. So this is not uh, an uncommon phenomenon, you know. So what are the sources of stress at work? Uh, that's the next slide. Uh, I mean, we look into about four areas majorly, uh, the roles and the tasks and the rules and regulation of the individual as a one block. What roles does this individual perform? And it has also to do with some of the other logistics of the work, the tasks, the rules, the regulations. How clear is the job prescription, the availability of resources, the opportunities for participation as perceived by the individual and also the perceived control of the individual. How much control do I have over my work? Uh, sometimes we just as we I'm just working, I don't have control. I only do what I'm asked to do. Why does it damage your work? You know? And then uh, we talk about the, the perception of the individual about the reward contingency. Do you think you know you have uh, reward, the reward commensurate with the input and all that? It has to do with uh, promotion, pay, all those things put together. And then changes at work. Uh, we do know during the pandemic, a lot of uh, changes came to work, you know, workspace, working from home and all those factors and whatever, social distancing. And sometimes some other, you know, organizational changes do occur. And the more frequently these changes occur, the more disturbance to the steady state of the worker as we define stress. So apart from the role and the task, then the next is about the work relationship, the relationship of people at work, the, the, you know, the colleagues, the relationship between the worker and the boss and all that. And we shall, uh, so these are also very important. And then they, we also want to uh, talk about the work environment, uh, including things like you know, the aesthetics of the work environment, how conducive it is and all that, then uh, safety concerns. Safety concerns really affect health workers a lot in terms of the issue of uh, you know, uh, pandemics, infection risks of this and that, whatever. Where well, we've just escaped, well, I, I don't know how far, where are we in the COVID-19 pandemic? I think the pressure is less on us now uh, than it was at the peak in the 2020 period. So then the final thing on the sources of work as, as at work is the personal attribute, you yourself. Uh, sometimes the environment, the work environment is really not a problem, but it's you. What you bring in into the work environment may actually be what is causing your stress, your personality, your cognitive styles, your coping styles, your skills. It's well known that the less skills you have at work, professional skills, the more stressful the job will be. I mean, if I administer an injection or even take service professionals, which we belong to. Uh, we have human service professionals. Uh, these are a group of occupational uh, occupationals or workers, you know, who work a large amount with a large amount of contact with people in need of uh, assistance and help. Uh, this includes social workers, nurses, teachers, lawyers, physicians, and you'll be surprised, police officers too. They are human services professionals because they, their work is our work is with contact with people requiring assistance. And it's like each assistance, each contact really is, you are dispensing yourself, not just your skill, your knowledge, even yourself, your personal attributes uh, to the uh, uh, caregiver uh, receiver. And then working in such field puts the caregiver under a lot of recognized strain, as I've mentioned earlier. Uh, but then the focus is on the clients, we are clients focused, you know, and that is really the bit of the problem. So caregivers' uh, well-being is critical to effectiveness of their work. Uh, I think that is that cannot be overemphasized. So what is burnout? Uh, 
1974, uh, Freedom Burger uh, described you know, an individual who has burned out as uh, someone in a state of fatigue or frustration brought about by devotion to a cause, a way of life or a relationship that has failed to produce the expected reward, the expected goal. That's simply what burnout means. When you are committed to a goal, you know, a relationship, a service, and a frustration of meeting it, it gets the person to a state of fatigue. That's burnout. So we see burnout as a stress response among uh, you know, healthcare you know, givers or um, professionals in human services. And the, the man or woman, the individual who does not uh, reach for the top will never suffer burnout. So it's, you know, burnout is, of course, characteristically among people who are very, you know, you know, focused on getting their goals accomplished, which is a very good thing. But then some of the things we'll be looking at now is how to prevent burnout in, uh, in us, yeah. So the burnout syndrome, as described by Fordenberger, really is about three-part syndrome. The three-part syndrome, uh, which is both physical, emotional, exhaustion on one part, and it involves the development of negative self-concept, uh, negative job attitude, and loss of concern and feeling for clients. Those are the, the, the things that we see, the features of the syndrome. And, if I repeat again, so number one would be emotional exhaustion. Number two, which what is called depersonalization. And the number three uh, is a personal feeling of personal inefficacy. The emotional exhaustion is just as it speaks. The person feels as if he has dispensed himself out for and without reward and he feels exhausted. It's not just emotionally, even feels exhausted physically also. A state of fatigue. And it is to be differentiated from tedium, which is you know when you are carrying out a boring job and you feel fed up with it, tired about it. That's not burnout. You know that's you know repetitive work, monotonous. But mental, I mean, a healthcare job is a very you know engaging and uh, diverse work. But the component of it really is what leads to that emotional ex exhaustion. Then the depersonalization is really. Uh, a tendency to uh, to detach, you know, to detach from the clients that you are actually uh, rendering the service to. I mean, it's like you know, you, the person gets a point, he gets data, and this is common. I mean, sometimes we hear complaints. I mean, those, those health workers they just treat people as if they are not human beings. What they are telling you that you are getting, you're experiencing burnout. I mean, and truly, if you look at ourselves, even on the words, we might not even remember the name of patients. All we remember is his diagnosis. Oh, the patient with appendix, the patient with asthma, you know, the name and the individuality of the person is gone. It's really a form of uh, detachment behavior, really. And that's really, it's a defense, sort of. It starts as a defense. We are trained to have detached concern when we are taking care of our clients, but when it becomes uh, an illness, or sorry, not an illness, as the burnout syndrome, it's really, it's, uh, it's extreme and it's called depersonalization. And we refer to clients as objects, you know, you know it's a work, by work, uh, work detachment behavior. And then the feeling of personal uh, inefficiency is actually towards ourselves when we begin to feel and to doubt our competency. And we begin to see is it demotivating effect as if I'm helpless, I'm useless, you know. And people get to that point that they feel useless and they don't even, what can I do? I mean, going to work just becomes a routine. Um, if, I, if anybody asks, do you, do, do you think you are useful at work? I mean, to say the truth, you feel, I'm not even sure whether I'm still useful. So it's a state of delusionment, really, which happens. So that, that's the three parts to this syndrome. Uh, what's the magnitude? How common is this burnout? Uh, remember, we are now going that the same burnout is a stress response among you know, uh, health professionals, not only that, human service professionals. 
but it's commoner among health workers than non-health uh, workers, even though it occurs among other uh, non-health uh, human service professionals. But it's, it's, the research has found that it's common among health workers, and that one in twelve of health workers do suffer from you know uh, burnout. You know that was a study back 1992, uh, and it's estimated about three to thirty to forty percent of doctors in the study done by uh, Henderson in 1984 actually found an estimate of thirty to forty of doctors. You know. And then among specialized specialists, there are some specialist specialization differences. Uh, there was there was a work done among male specialists and psychiatrists who are found to have the highest level of burnout. You can imagine why, you know, uh, dealing with chronic illnesses, you know, relapsing illnesses, you know, lifelong illnesses. That I mean, but note that. Psychiatrists or mental health professionals are not the only people dealing with people with chronic uh, illnesses. And it's also found that there is higher burnout, uh, other higher burnout specialties, like people dealing with any form of chronic illnesses, incurable illnesses, and even dying patients. You know? uh, so these are some of the characteristics. And it's also found that even among those groups, the non specialists among them have higher scores of uh, burnout. And then the lowest cause of uh, uh, burnout is among people working in private practice, universities, certain research institutions, and uh, public offices and organizations. How about gender marital effect? Yes, uh, well, it's not about uh, uh, gender you know, typing, but females are known to have higher burnout than males. And then about the main level of stress is higher also among the singles or married than uh, the married. Uh, so now let's go to some etiological factors. Uh, some of them we've mentioned along the line, but let's now bring them together. Uh, burnout is often regarded as an organizational problem, you know, uh, because it could be found more in some organization than the others, depending on the organizational practices. And the, these characteristics of health service as being a, a patient-centered you know, uh, organization is really one of the things that are focus, although most uh, other professionals, health service professionals to the focus on their clients. But I think it's more emphasized, you know, um, more blown out in uh, health services. So the focus on patient-centered quality service delivery. And if you look at those you know, criteria for quality service, talk about safety, talk about timeliness, uh, talk about effectiveness, efficacy, equality, patients. There's nothing about you know, the healthcare providers there talking about quality, except we say, oh, you must have the right skill to deliver the, the job, okay? And uh, so th those are some of those things that really make uh, the health service uh, a, a prone to uh, burnout. Then some organizational environments like the role and case overloads, institutional insensitivities to clients need, not just, not even, even workers need. Some institutions, it's, it appears from the arrangement of things, you know, uh, maybe when the laboratory is uh, about one kilometer from the emergency and patients and patient relatives have to walk about one kilometer down. It, the toll is not just on the clients, the toll is also on the workers. So these are some of the things which, you know, so insensitivity to, to client needs, which could actually result from burnout experience, is actually a cycle. Inadequate job supervision, uh, in a, in, inadequate job training and orientation, lack of sense of participation by the worker himself, uh, or lack of sense of control over his job and all that. These are some of the factors that can lead to burnout. And then when a majority of the time is spent on administrative and paperwork, actually those are also very fertile grounds for uh, burnout among health workers. And also we also look at the level of support among the staff themselves, they're not support between the, uh, the staff and the, the bosses, the, uh, the supervisors. 
Then individual factors, which we mentioned earlier, it were related to stress, also specific to burnout, which could be individuals with high traits, high scores in neuro, neuroticism, which is a personality trait. Uh, really, people with high score in neuroticism, uh, they, what are the neuroticism scale, I mean, traits, you know, excessive worries, anxiety, proneness, and you know, feeling of uncertainties and things. These are traits, these are things you find in neuroticism. And then people set unrealistic goals and expectations for themselves, for their career and all that. So these are also individual factors and individual with low self-esteem, inflexibility, and people with passive coping strategy. That's the absence of assertiveness skill. Uh, these are factors that actually get people are prone to developing uh, the burnout response, you know, to stress. In uh, some published studies, which I uh, you know, carried out, uh, that was in 2013, the, the, one, the column on the right is actually about uh, the ex executives, which I mentioned earlier. We found, you know, factors associated with stress include female gender, younger age, you know, uh, single marital status, the post in organization. This is interesting now. Post in organization, we found middle managers were more stressed than even the higher managers. But the other says, the, uh, what is it now? Uh, uneasy lies the header wears the crown. So then I came to a conclusion, I say it depends on the size of the crown. If you're wearing a small crown, then it may be heavier than if you are really actually wearing a very big crown. And I fed this back to the subgroup of executives. I said, mm, they could understand what that means. Uh, they felt, well, the big or gas at the top, uh, they know the, 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 the safety checks that have been in place. I mean, how they can take some insurance to escape, you know, going into bankrupt, I mean, some saved funds to escape bankruptcy. Whereas the younger manager who doesn't have all the information is afraid they might soon be laid off and all that. So these are some of the issues. So sometimes the higher, you know, top hierarchy leaders, they, they have some information uh, which will help them to cope with the challenges of work than uh, the lesser manager. Although we can interpret it this way that it's the lower manager that are facing the, 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 the fire of the work itself, uh, but it's not necessarily so. So now uh, also subjective physical health rating, people with high level of stress also rate their, rated their physical health as very poor. And we also found association with medication use for other health conditions and uh, the, especially the use of analgesic, use of sleeping pills. And very interestingly, we find higher cholesterol level among people with high level of stress, you know. Then among health workers, you know, people, uh, undergoing shift work are more stressed. Night shift, uh, people complain about understaffing, uh, poor boss and colleague relationship and support, uh, job satisfaction, and also job turnover intentions. The intention to, to shift your job and all those things, these are some of the factors uh, that are associated. So now recognizing the, uh, the impact of stress in organizations and individuals, as an individual, we should be able, we should be sensitive to know when there might be stress going on in our lives. Like you, you need to look out for the unusual things, uh, and we have an acronym for that: you know, stress, sadness, terror, rage, excitement, shame, and sleep disturbance. What do I mean with this? Uh, Any time there's this feeling of, of unusual low mood, you wake up in the morning or in the last few days, I've not really been, been feeling very happy. You can't really pinpoint what is the cause. It's not that you've lost anything. I mean, it's just telling you, it's a signal, warning that there's stress in the house, check. And you might really need to really look closely before you know that, okay, I'm going through this. Unusual anxiety and fears, you know, unusual irritability, anger, unusual excitement. That looks paradoxical when unusual and people ask, oh, you look, you are so excited this morning. I say, wow, I don't know myself. I think I feel happy. Oh, unusual happiness when there's no lottery, no new lottery of one. 
It's Miss just suggest that you are just trying to cope with uh, stress in your life, really. And then when there's feeling of self doubt and guilt, or and also the the ubiquitous uh, sleep disturbance, unusual. You just found out that in the last few nights I've not been sleeping well. There's stress in the house. Other big bodily complaints that even when you take it to the uh, to complain to a colleague, to a doctor, and, and they, they can't understand what is going on. And then this may lead to various psychosomatic disorders if the cycle is not broken uh, fast. In organizations, we see uh, impact of stress as disharmony, organizational disharmony uh, with factions and divisions, disputes and conflicts, uh, job avoidance behavior, people bringing, uh, you know, uh, sick leaves and absenteeism and all those ones. Even presentism, people are talk but they're not doing their work. And then there could also be high level of work accident and errors, clinical errors. Uh, these are things that will point out, uh, bring attention to the fact that there may be stress in the organization. High job turnover and intentions. You know, people are, they, they've not, they only, they're only staying behind because they won't go to uh, alternatives and well, I'm just doing the job because of the pay, because I need to pay my house rent, and then decline obviously declining product productivity. These are some of the uh, impacts. So now let's go to how do we? I mean, I, we can't be going to the full pathophysiology and all the things that stress cause because uh, this is a very short uh, talk. Really, let's just go to how do we prevent burnout? Yes. Uh, it begins with organizational practices and changes that can be uh, put in place. Uh, number one, talk about you know, trying to moderate the client-staff ratio to a level that we know is uh, conducive uh, for health and the well-being of the workers. Uh, this is to prevent overload, you know. Avoiding extend, extended work hours unnecessary over time. Although sometimes because of shortage of staff and all that, I mean, so uh, with, it goes with one, except when the individual is only looking for overtime for additional pay, you know, which we should advise him not to, you know. And then allowing opportunity for timeout, even while at work, there should be opportunity for timeout, you know, restrooms, oh, not restroom, I'm using the wrong word now. Yes, it, it, it should be a restroom, but we've changed, uh, conveniences to restroom anyway, so it doesn't matter. But we should have you know, uh, timeout rooms in, of where people could just hang out and talk, have snacks, maybe watch television, play games for a brief moment and then go back to the offices or a place they can stroll around within the work environment. You know? And then sharing client loads uh, through maybe in hospital setting, doing staff rotation between units and all that. So everybody have the same, you know, handle on, on the very difficult cases and all that. So it's not just group of, you know, categories of uh, workers that are only you know, facing the, the, the tough jobs. And then the function of staff meeting is not just about, oh, yeah, come and give the report of your work and everybody's blasted for not meeting up to standard. No, it should be uh, the settings for clarifying goals, sharing problems, informal socialization. People should look forward to staff meetings improving work relationship and teamwork. Uh, obviously, the, also the CPD continuing uh, professional development should be ongoing so that people need to upscale, you know, upscale their skills and uh, sharpen their skills because the better skilled you are, the, the, the less stressful the job is to you. Uh, then there should also be institutional, institutionalized welfare, health and safety practices. And uh, finally, I put, I mean, institution sponsors social activities. I have, in my organization, my attention was just drawn to that. I mean, to make it physical, to say, wow, how often do you go on weekend treats for your team members? I say, wow, that's true. We think we socialize, but calling ourselves together to have a treat and all that we really, and immediately the following week, we, we, we had to add one. Who knows, it was quite interesting. So uh, now, general stress. Now let's go to general stress coping strategies. You know, as, as an individual, we need to know ourselves. You know your strength, your weakness. It's like doing a SWOT on yourself. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And I mean, what opportunities do I have? What are the threats in my life? 
you know, we need to do that constantly. You know, that self-awareness really gives us, you know where you're good at and you don't go for what you're not good at doing. Yes, except you want to pick up the skills first, then recognizing uh, stress. When you're under stress, you should be able to recognize. Don't just brush it aside and you know, recognize and acknowledge, you know, in self, even in others, you need to tell someone, hey, you look, I mean, sometimes they remind your business. <laughs> but the common thing is when, when the boss is becoming irritable, banging the door, everybody knows it. Ah, what's wrong with your guy this morning? Uh, be uh, the quarrel at home or whatever. So, you know, yes, let's not forget, sometimes we carry over stress from the home environment to work, could also be another problem, or even carry over from the environment. And then we need, when we recognize, we need to quickly do a stress audit, identify the source, what's happening, what's, what's going on. Sometimes it could look so hidden until you, you may now suddenly remember, okay, was it because, you know, uh, at the last meeting, I said the company is not doing well, uh, we may have to you know, downsize and all that. And you take that person and I say, I see, are you the only one? You know, so that's really part of the troubleshooting. So, okay, maybe that information that is getting me sleepless. So you need to do something about it. And then the, the rule of stress management is act, don't react. Many times we only react. And that is really the, uh, the autonomic nervous system level. It's like a reflex reaction. When you see a lion jump, jump out of the, uh, 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 of the bush or something on, where you're on the path, the next thing is you turn back. You, is, you don't even think about it. You just do it reflexly. You know, and then sometimes something happens, you just shout reflexly. But the rule of stress management is act, take a time, look at the situations, what is going on. Before you know, you see what you thought was a lion, you just a uh, what now? Maybe just a, a teddy, but somebody just playing a prank at you and just doing something uh, on the road for you, something of that nature you need to take. That's the, you know, allowing the frontal loop to take over rather than leaving it at the level of the, well, I'm going physiological, uh, anatomical now, amygdala. So action is a planned behavior, whereas reaction is just emotion linked or impulsive. Uh, if you remember the story of the bomb blast in Kedja in those days, that people ran and they, many of them drowned in the in one canal. That was just pure reaction, you know, not action, a bomb blast truly, but then, well, why run into a canal and then die in the canal? So that's really act, you know, the bringing out the issue of acting, not just reacting. Uh, then seeking support is very important. We should not be so egoistic to think uh, it's not manly to ask for support, you know, and then support can be emotional, can be physical, material. If you need some, you know, box from people, you know, Oh, I need five naira there, please. I, I don't have money to take even transport or cut back home. Please feel quickly, feel free to ask, you know, rather than, you know, both of say, I walk home. Yes, it's good exercise for you. So seeking support and accepting it. Skills en enhancement, sharpening our skills. Uh, I've mentioned about the, you know, the lack of professional skills. It's actually a, a very, you know, fatal source of stress and burnout. If you have the appropriate skill, each job, each uh, care, you know, each client we meet is really, wow, it's an, another opportunity to display your professional skills and you really enjoy the interaction. But if we're not, if you don't have the appropriate skills for our job, uh, take for instance, even maybe giving an injection and you are not sure, I hope I won't cause enough damage here. Is it the left, right, quarter, upper, whatever, and you are confused. I mean, it shows there's something wrong. And then so professional skills is very important and it reduces our stress. When we, so that's why the need for the continued professional uh, development. Problems, problem solving skills. I think let's move on fast now. Time management, sometimes most of our stress is because we don't manage our time well. And then we put ourselves on that time pressure. Uh, to achieve our task and goals. And then we need to learn to have audits of how do I spend my time that I don't have enough time left 
to do the necessary the priorities. So social skills and communication skills, uh, that's very important. Many people get themselves into stress because of their communication styles, you know, poor social skills, uh, you know. And I've mentioned about assertiveness training. You need to know when to say no. I mean, not to add on additional rules and whatever. Uh, sorry, I have enough for my desk uh, politely and in a socially acceptable way. And, you know, so those who live passively, uh, passive, you know, uh, control, I mean, they, they run into trouble with uh, uh, burnout easily. Then cognitive scoping, this is about thinking. Uh, people, we used to talk about positive thinking, but it's not really about positive thinking, about thinking right. Uh, there's a lot of dysfunctional thinking, uh, which have become a pattern in our lives, we call it schema. And there is something we've grown with, and the first thought that comes out in any situation is just the negative one, and then, and then everything. So any information, or oh, something is going to happen, the heaven is going to fall, and then the person is yeah, yeah, I'm in trouble. It means, I mean, the next thing is, I'm not the only one. It's going to happen to everybody. So let's life go on. I mean, that, those are really ways of handling, you know, uh, thinking right. So we need to learn to catch those automatic thoughts that are, you know, creating stress in our lives, challenge them with facts for and against, and then uh, try to change them. And that's uh, call it thought the attribution. Uh, because of our time, I need to go for this. I think this is the last slide now. Uh, the lifestyle modifications, this include physical exercise. And when we carry out physical activities, what we are doing is we are actually uh, mopping up the, those stress chemicals and hormones. Under stress, the flight or flight mode of stress is like to make us to be prepared to escape, you know, um, the, the primitive you know, stress coping is you know, facing lions, uh, you know, facing danger, threats. But most of the stress we have now, you, there's nothing about life threatening. If anything, it's really psychological. You know, and, then, and all the chemicals, the body doesn't know the difference. It will release the chemicals, you know, release glucose for you to be able to fight you know, or to run, release adrenaline, release cortisol you know, for you to... And all these are body damaging, they are physiologically damaging to the body. And uh, it's in the pathway, you know, I told you the study we found high level of cholesterol. Yes, the pathway of cortisol metabolism, yes, you see cholesterol also uh, showing up somewhere there. So that's really to mop up all these chemicals you need to now, even though this stress does not demand physical fight, you now create a real physical fight for yourself. You know, that's really the physical exercise. And it's been recommended that a 30 minutes uh, exercise, physical exercise, three times a week might just be sufficient uh, for you to take care of stress. It's not for your cardiac functioning, but for stress, you know, taking care of your stress, uh, three days a week, minimum of 30 weeks, that takes you to the level of breathlessness. Yes, that's very important. It may be sufficient to mop up all the excess adrenaline and the excess. And then when you become executives and you just sit down on the, on the seat and it's call secretary to come and order everybody around that, you are killing yourself. So we need to learn to stand up and walk around and do some. And they wonder, oh, how are you? I, I should have called us. <laughs> you want to kill me? Let me do it myself. These are some of the fun of leadership. And relaxation techniques is the other way. It's about winding down. When you're under stress, we are really under tension. The muscle tone is high when we're under stress. So what we're doing with relaxation training and techniques is really to unwind some of this tension because under such state, there's also some other issues. And the methods, we talk about progressive muscle relaxation, this is like, you know, systematic, you know, you know uh, relaxation from the head down. It's like you center on the head and say, wow, any tension there in the neck, any tension, and you're speaking to yourself, come on, relax, and you do it down to the foot, sitting down 20 minutes a day. You know, it's not too much of a time to do that. You could also do the controlled breathing in which you deliberately breathe in deeply and out, you know, slowly. Uh, when we're under stress, we breathe shallow. Our breath is very shallow and we're not taking in enough oxygen. 
and we are not releasing the carbon, carbon dioxide, and then the whole system is thrown into a metabolic mess. And that's really, and that compounds the stress and it's also health damaging. So these are some of the things to do them. While we're doing that, we can also do the visualization, imagining the best site you have been to. I mean, I've been at the seaside and you know, while you are doing the relaxation or the control breathing. Uh, if we're doing a workshop, I could get us into all this together and you find that it really works, really. Uh, then avoiding burnout, uh, avoiding overloads. Our brain could be overloaded, uh, roles can be overloaded, emotions can be overloaded. Brain overload, we're talking about when you keep so much things, information in the brain that are not necessary. They are meant for the books to be written down in diaries, in lists, in notes, you know, and yet you want to keep it, all the appointments of the day, you want to keep it in your head, uh, go to the shopping, all the things you need to buy, you keep it in your head. <laughs> Obviously, that is like over, how much RAM do you have in the brain, by the way? You know, so that's really, and before you know it, there'll be a hangout and you come back home, oh, the most important thing you went to the market for, you forgot. And you say, okay, I'll go back tomorrow. That's really a sign of brain overload. And even when you walk in the office because of the loaded fact, you put it there, if I leave office, I'll branch out which market now. So by this, it's competing with all the other functions. You won't even remember instructions for your work at, you know, these are some of the problems. So brain overload can be reduced through uh, use of diary, lists, and we have so much electronic gadgets to work with now uh, without allowing those ones to, to add to your overload. Role overload is just by delegation. You should have trusted people to delegate your work to, except otherwise you are not a good leader or whatever. Then emotional overload, you can take care of that by ventilation. What's ventilation? Just talking to somebody. Just talking, do you know what I'm going through? That's just it. I mean, I don't want them to know my secret, to know my mess. No, let people know your mess. The more of your mess you share, the less you know, troubled you become. Control exposure is about you know, confronting your fears. Forgiveness, uh, that is it. That's one of those things we put in the brain. Oh, oh, he did this to me. My boss, I can never forget him. I can never forgive him. I, you know. And the, the place of what become a place you really you can't you, you're not comfortable going memory ghosts well uh ghost hunts right the same with memories of bad events and that's of course in post-traumatic stress disorders you know uh those are some of the yes uh i saw a flash on how do you take care of the personalization yes it's really being aware of it that you are depersonalizing you see those who work in maternity uh, they, it's very common. I mean, they, uh, they say, oh, those nurses, they are so wicked to ask you when you are shouting, when you are that in labor, you are shouting, they say, oh, uh, am I the one that, you know, did it or what, all those you know, comments and that's the personalization. And so you need to be aware of those things. That's about stress awareness. Your awareness will bring you to you know, and then you deliberately with skills now, professional skills, be able to deal with uh, them. And then uh, work leisure balance. That's actually where I'm going to stop now. Uh, work leisure balance is about balancing uh, your work. We, we believe the, the right side, of the, the left part of the brain carries out most of the work and productivity activity, whereas the right uh, hemisphere of the brain is concerned with leisure activities. So, as it were, if you do just walk, 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 and little play, uh, you are overworking the left brain, and it's like it's, your head is tilted to the left. <laughs> I mean, that's really, so to speak, really. So you need to balance it up, and you know, balance work and play. And then with timeouts, uh, non-work related retreats and holidays, and you know, the harmonization of work and leisure is really about turning your labor, your work into leisure. Uh, that's, it's, it's, we can spend the whole day talking about that. How do you turn your labor into leisure? Uh, well, number one, let me just give you some three tips to that. I mean, you love your job. Many people don't love their job. They're just doing it for the pay. Come on, you need to love your job. In those days, you see volleyball players, and by the time they hit the ball, and then they throw it over, and they say, wow, I love this game. 
say, wow, that's great, you know. And you really go to work and return and say, wow, I love my job. I wonder what else I would do, I'll be doing than this. I mean, sometimes I speak that back to myself. I say, after I've seen a difficult patient, you know, and that's really stressed me. And I say, wow, I wonder what else I'll be doing if I don't do this. I'll be useless. And this is really a joy, really, of doing. So that's really, uh, you know, so that's really so, some comments on this are distracting me, but no problem. I'm okay. I'm looking, I'm minding them. So that's uh, about turning work. Then that's, that's it, loving your job. Number two is learning your job, learning the skills for your job. And when you don't have the skills for the job, the job becomes a labor. Uh, the, and then the, the final thing is landscaping, landscaping your job, your work environment, making your work environment conducive, you know, uh, for work. And when you do those three things, your work short becomes a labor. Imagine the roadside laborer by the roadside, and it's just digging away. Uh, well, permit me to speak the vernacular, and it's just singing in me, why to leave? And they just digging away. Ah. And this chief executive in the car just look at the side and he had this man singing, <laughs> who has came to this difficult one, if not you. And the man, well, it means, you know, and while he's there, he's playing, chatting with everybody, pure water girl, come, give me one. He buys, where's money? I don't even have the money. I'll give you tomorrow. Fun, it's turned it into fun. So we should turn our labor, our work into fun. That's really about turning our labor into leisure. Finally, get the money. And that, that, that's the role of money in, in stress management. Yes, the, uh, the scriptures tells us love of money is the beginning of all evils, you know. Yes, if you chase money too badly, you're going to be stressed up. But if you have moderate money to buy escapes, you know, uh, take holidays, you know, that's really one of stress management. So money can play some part in managing stress, but not about setting your heart at getting money at all costs. Like this person, I wonder how she got there. The last slide, please. Oh, yes. I don't know how she got there. It's like she's buying escape from all the hazards at work. So blessed are those whose work and leisure are the same. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I okay, cannot you. emphasize how important this topic is. Okay. You know, as healthcare workers, we um, our patients are dependent on us, so we need to be top notch. We need to understand how to manage stress. I learned something today. I have a question regarding that. Yeah, I learned something very important. So thank you so much for today's topic. It was it's a very 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 vital topic for us as healthcare workers, and you know, to help us do better at our jobs. Thank you.